thank you very much. I'll get my stuff over here. Well, welcome everybody to the Forge Road Bible Chapel 2023 Church Picnic. And uh, it's a great blessing to be here. This is uh, one of the years, I guess in my recent memory, where it hasn't rained and needed to be rescheduled. So it's a, it's a great blessing to be here with you all. We have a little bit of a, a challenge today because it's dark in here, and I hope that I don't put you to sleep. So try, try, to, try to stay awake. Um, because we're, we're doing lunch together, like Nora said, we have communion at the end of the service, and we're going to be doing uh, some baptisms at 2 o'clock. I'm going to be a little bit more brief uh, than normal, so uh, just bear with me on that. Also, um, because we're a little scaled down today, I have my, uh, what do you call these things, a tablet. So bear with me on that as well. It's, it's been working good, but if I have a, a technological hiccup, please forgive me. So we're continuing our series today in The Son of Man Came Eating and Drinking. And Kyle Sobis explained in a previous message that this series serves as an exploration of Jesus' ministry and teaching centered around shared tables. Tables shared with friends and enemies, clean and unclean, sick and well, rich and poor, insiders and outcasts, oppressors and oppressed, saints and sinners. And we're particularly going to be looking at the insiders and outsiders and saints and sinners designation today. So our passage comes from Luke 7, and it's verses 36 through 50. And I invite you to pull out your phones, or if you brought your Bible, go ahead and open up that portion of Scripture. Uh, it's a very straightforward story, and it's definitely worth putting your eyes on the text. But before we go to the Word, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus, we have often strayed from your ways and followed too much the desires of our own hearts. We have done things that we should not have, and we have failed to do the things that we should have. Lord, have mercy on us. Open the eyes of our hearts that we may see you. Restore within us clean hearts, O Lord, and let us hear your voice today and run into your loving embrace finding mercy and acceptance in your holy presence. In Jesus' name, amen. So before we uh, read the passage, I just wanted to point something out to you. The Luke 7 passage looks a lot like the Matthew 26 passage where Mary, uh, she pours out an alabaster jar on Jesus' head. But this, this is actually a different passage. It's... Uh, it's very similar, but not the same one. That Matthew account takes place in Bethany. This one takes place in Galilee. And the one in Bethany happens during Passion Week, right before Jesus is crucified. But this is much earlier in Jesus' ministry. So just keep that in mind. Um, and I wanted to actually invite my daughter Annalise to come up and read the passage of Scripture for us today. So, Annalise, you... Welcome to come up and you know if any of these microphones on.
to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, You have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? Then he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Thank you, Annalise. So, did you notice that Jesus refers to both of them as debtors who cannot pay? Simon keeps the technical letter of the law, but he refuses to honor the spirit behind it, love. Jesus says to Simon, I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. You gave me no kiss. You did not anoint my head with oil. Technically, he didn't have to do any of those things. It wasn't legally required. The woman, on the other hand, she fails to keep the letter of the law. She's described as a sinner. But she honors Jesus with the faith of her love. A faith that won't let Jesus go. She washed his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. She kissed his feet and anointed them with fragrant oil. A number of years ago, Laura and I were having a backyard barbecue, and we invited lots of friends, faithful, strong believers in the Lord, and, uh, well, like bacon at a bar mitzvah, an unlikely, uninvited, and unpleasant guest showed up. For the sake of confidentiality, I'm going to call him John. I knew John, but we were not what you would call friends. In my opinion, John was awkward and loud. He smoked nonstop, he drank too much, and he had a host of all kinds of other unpleasant addictions. So John stumbles into our backyard in a way that looks like he's intoxicated, and he's got an acoustic guitar with him as well. And so I thought, well, maybe somebody invited John and invited him to participate, and maybe he'll play some worship with us, and it'll turn out okay. But John ambles off by himself to a chair on our patio and pulls out his guitar, and he starts playing, and then he starts chain smoking, and in between unpleasant verbal outbursts, he's playing 90s alternative rock songs, loudly. So inwardly, I'm cringing, and outwardly, I'm keeping my distance. But probably I didn't keep my distance enough because I sat there and watched him chain smoke one cigarette after another and crush them on my new gas fire religious purity, legalism, but secular codes of virtue, too. We focus so much on the outside when really Jesus says it's the inside that needs to be cleaned. Matthew 15, 19 through 20 says, For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, slanders, these are the things which defile a man, not whether he washes his hands or how he washes his cup. Yet, we are inundated with these mandates to clean up the outside, clean up the outside. The Rolling Stones song, Beast of Burden, and you can thank me later when you're singing in your head. This song captures the exhaustion of trying to live up to these kinds of systems. He says, ain't I rough enough? Oh honey, ain't I tough enough? Ain't I rich enough? In love enough? Please. Today, it's more like, 
Am I politically concerned enough? Am I signaling enough support for the going social agenda? Am I offended enough? Am I accepting enough? Am I ashamed enough? Am I outraged enough? Am I watching the right programs enough? Am I low emission, low carbon, eco-friendly, locally sourced, and organic enough? And the list goes on and on. David Brooks, opinion writer for the New York Times, says, using the current politically correct lingo is a two-edged sword. On the one hand, it's a sure sign that you've got cultural capital coming out of your ears. But on the other, you never know when the usage rules have changed so that something that was sayable five years ago will now get you fired. It's impossible to find grace in systems focused on outward behavior. We cancel, we terminate, we silence, we shut down, we berate, we demand justice. We might not end up punishing you, but we will never truly forgive you. We issue rap sheets so others can see your prior bad acts and judge accordingly. That's our social contract. We idolize and we demonize. You don't believe me? The hottest show on Netflix right now is the Johnny Depp defamation trial. Legalism places the pretense of performance over restoration and healing. Theologian Reinhold Niver remarks, there is no deeper pathos in the spiritual life of man than the cruelty of self-righteous people. Tim Keller talks about moralism versus Christianity. He says the difference is that the moralist will admit that they violated the law, but the Christian will confess that he has attempted to atone for his sins by his own works. He cries out in his heart, not my record, but Jesus' record, not my past, but his past, not my goodness, but his, not my works, but his sacrifice. So, looking at verse 40 of our text, Jesus answers Simon. Notice, Jesus went ahead and answered him. Simon wasn't even talking to him. It's funny how sometimes Jesus will just answer us, even when we're not posing a question to him. And that's what Jesus does here. Simon, he says, I have something to say to you. He goes on to tell the parable of the debtors. And then if you jump down to verse 47, he says, Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. These outward systems that we've been talking about uh, where we judge ourselves against others, they don't allow for forgiveness. And so they don't allow for love, or grace, or acceptance. So my big question going through this passage was, why did Jesus expose Simon so publicly like that? What's going on here? Well, my thought is, we tend to look at Pharisees as the typecast, monolithic bad guy that Jesus just can't wait to rebuke. I mean, we kind of picture ourselves, at least sometimes I do if I'm being honest, like I'm standing behind Jesus throwing stones at the Pharisees. But I think a healthier perspective would be to place ourselves in the shoes of the Pharisee, especially in this story. So Jesus, he's got something to say to Simon, and by extension, to me, to all of us. And he wants Simon to listen just as much as he wants to gather in this outcast woman and forgive her sins. 
Flannery O'Connor, a writer of stories that center on outcasts and sermonizing criminals and self-righteous proper southern ladies, said, my audience are the people who think God is dead. To the hard of hearing, you shout. And for the almost blind, you draw large and startling figures. Could that be what Jesus is doing for Simon? In O'Connor's short story, Revelation, and I know some of the guys here have read that with me. Thanks a lot, everyone. Uh, Mrs. Turpin, a proper southern lady, comes into a doctor's waiting room with her husband, who has been kicked by a cow. There's a whole host of different characters in the waiting room, of which she immediately sizes up and begins to classify into different social stratospheres. One of the characters is a well-dressed, perfectly mannered, middle-aged woman. Her teenage daughter, however, is dour and menacing. She stares daggers at Mrs. Turpin as Mrs. Turpin and the mother exchange conversation about how you have to have certain things to know certain things. As Mrs. Turpin is busy judging the teenage girl and thanking God that she's not like the others in the waiting room, the teenage girl launches a book at Mrs. Turpin's face, knocks her clean out of the chair, and tells her to go back to the devil, where she belongs. Through a series of events, Mrs. Turpin comes to believe that God sent her this alarming message. Throughout the rest of the story, though, she struggles as she compares herself to people that she thinks are less than she is. In a final standoff with God, she shakes her fist in the air saying, I could quit working and take it easy and be filthy. Go ahead, put that bottom rail on the top. There'll still be a top and a bottom. Who do you think you are? And God's answer returns to her like a streak of light. She sees a swinging bridge and on it are crowds of unsavory folks rumbling toward heaven, clean for the first time in their lives, shouting and clapping. Bringing up the rear were people like herself, marching with great dignity, accountable as they had always been for good order and common sense and respectable behavior. Yet she could see by their shocked and altered faces that even their virtues were being burned away. Flannery hit her self-centered character over the head of grace. And I can't help but to think that's exactly what Jesus is doing with Simon. We know what happens to the woman. Jesus tells her that her sins are forgiven and her faith has saved her. But we don't know what happens to Simon at the end of this story. Why? This lesson of Jesus and, and this desperate woman is, I believe, training us what faith actually looks like. In a merciless world where there are insiders and outsiders, living faith takes the shape of a desperate sinner who courageously falls at the mercy of Jesus. So what happens? Does Simon become a believer? Does he surrender his own righteousness and accept saving faith? Does he choose to see that even though his debt may seem less than this woman's, he, just like her, has no true ability to pay for it? I think Jesus gives Simon, and again, by extension, each of us, this wonderful, open-ended invitation to surrender our moralism, our self-righteousness, our self-justification, and to accept his work and his forgiveness for all of our sins, by His grace. Remember my uninvited guest, John, who showed up at my backyard barbecue? Matthew 25, 40 says, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. What I later realized was that Jesus came to my house for dinner, 
and he invited John. I gave him no water for his feet. I gave him no kiss. I did not anoint his head with oil. I failed to see the depth of my need at the foot of the cross, and I failed to extend the same mercy I myself had received. So here we are, seated at these tables, and we've invited Jesus to come and share a meal with us. How are we going to approach him? As the woman who genuinely sees her need for Jesus, willing to approach the throne of grace boldly, to be accepted, or will we sit quietly with folded arms and closed hearts in judgment of those coming just as they are? In Kyle's message, he, he said something very profound, and, and uh, it's, it's worth remembering. He said, it's no accident that this ministry happens over a shared meal, continuing in an unbroken line to the present day at churches and in homes throughout time and space. At the shared table, whether the Lord's Supper or any meal where Jesus is invited, the ordinary is joined by the holy. The typical is joined by the transformational. The creation meets the resurrection. And the reality of the kingdom of God breaks through into our everyday existence. Theologian Emil Bruner says, The solemn meal implies that the everyday world is wrought into the texture of saving history. And that saving history is implanted in the thick of everyday life. By sharing in this meal, we participate in the thing which actually is no thing at all. It's Him, Jesus Christ. We're not simply observing some tradition. We are in communion with our Savior, the head of the body, and with each other, the members of that same body. Inwardly, by sharing this meal together, we are asking Christ that we would be of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose, doing nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regarding one another as more important than ourselves, not merely looking out for our own personal interests, but also the interests of others. Bowing the knee with every creature, both in heaven and on earth, confessing with all of our hearts that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We are children of the living God. And he does not give us scraps from the table, but rather the bread, which is his body, and the cup, which is his blood, to assure us of his presence and faithfulness to us, regardless of what we're going through in life right now. So as you heard from Norris, in a minute or two, we're going to pass out the elements, the bread and the juice. And if you're here and you don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God who willingly exchanged his life for yours, and that he will raise you again to eternal life, and these simple elements will only be a tasteless wafer and some sugary juice. On their own, they have no inherent power to change or cleanse you. Only receiving Jesus as your Savior can do that. Jesus is calling you today. Don't harden your heart. Answer him and accept him. Fall at his feet and hear his words to you. Your sins are are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. If you do believe on Jesus as your Savior, but the inner Simon has hardened your heart, where you have been on this cycle of legalism and the failure that always attends it, Jesus is inviting you and me to repent, to break free from the yoke of that bondage and fear as ones who have received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. So at this time, I would ask that our...
communion guys pass out the elements. And um, I'm also going to invite Jeff and John to come up and pray for the bread and the cup, and we'll, we'll share it in that way. And then after communion, uh, we'll, we'll pray, and then we'll close out the meeting, and then we'll, we'll have lunch together, and then make sure that you go up to the baptism at 2 o'clock.